Well, good morning and welcome to Eastern Bible Church's online worship service. It's so good to be here. It's so good to be outside in the sunshine, even though there's snow on the ground. We give thanks to our God, who's a wonderful creator and blesses us and loves us so much. We'll be rescheduling our Connect class in the next few weeks. So those of you who register for that, be looking for that new date. We're excited to meet those who signed up. Uh, so be looking for that new day coming up in the near future. Uh, I'd like to share our EBC 100 story for this week, and it comes from Linda and Domer Zerby. Domer and I started coming to Easton about 45 years ago. We were looking for a church that would preach the gospel, help us to grow in our faith and knowledge of God's word, and also a church that had a good children's and youth program for any children we might have. We were also impressed an offering plate was not passed and that the church trusted the Lord to meet their needs. We visited for a few weeks and knew that the Lord had led us to the church he wanted us to attend. We are very thankful for the wonderful pastors that have taught us God's word and encouraged us in our faith. We've been very thankful for the many Christians that have blessed our lives with their prayers and friendships. We're very happy to be a part of Easton's family. May the Lord continue to bless Easton Bible Church. Love Domer and Linda Zerby. Domer and Linda, we love you. We thank you for blessing us and giving thanks to our God. And let's get ready now to worship our God as Pastor Steve teaches us about how to worship. Enjoy the message. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you're with us once again today. This morning, I would like to lead you on a journey, one that I hope will enrich your worship and our worship of King Jesus. Are you willing to go on a journey with me? You have to be willing. Will you be open to hearing God's message for your heart this morning? Are you with me? Okay, let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you that we can come boldly to your throne and worship you. But Lord, we don't do that arrogantly. Lord, we come before your throne with reverence, knowing that you are holy, that you are set apart, that you are our creator and we are your creation. And so we come to you this morning. We ask that you would infuse your word that has been divinely inspired through the Bible into our hearts and that we will be open to hear what you have to say to us. That you are a God that loves us, that dwells in our praises. You are enthroned on our praises. And so we ask your blessing now on our time. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll be leading us through four phases of worship today. The first stop, so to say, is preparing our hearts. The second is worshiping at the foot of the cross. Third, approaching the throne. And the fourth stop, praising the king. Now, these are not so much literal or liturgical phases that dictate the songs that we sing or the prayers that we pray or the scripture that we read so much as they are bookmarks for our mind and heart on this journey to worship. Their attitudes, their postures, you might say. And I believe that by keeping these attitudes and postures in mind, that we will approach the worship of our creator as we should. Before we start out on this journey, though, I'd like to take a few minutes and clarify some things about worship. First, let's look at the word worship. Mr. Webster defines the word worship as reverence offered a divine being or supernatural power. Also, an act of expressing such reverence. The verb form to honor or reverence as a divine being or supernatural power. To regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. Some of the synonyms are adore, deify, glorify, homage, revere, reverence, venerate, admire, honor, love, respect, dignify, exalt, magnify, extol. It's a word that comes from combining two words, the word worth and the suffix ship. Ship being a state of being, a condition of being. So we might say that something exists in a state of worth. It's the act of ascribing worth to something, worthy 
of reverence, worthy of honor, devotion, esteem. The act of ascribing worth to God. God is worth. Or God is worthy. In the Bible, the most common word for worship comes from translating the Greek word proskunio, which we also get the word to lie prostrate or to bow down before. So we may say God is the one that is worth bowing down before or worthy of our worship. Second, worship is life. As we know, worship is about more than just song time with song boy up here. Worship is ultimately a posture of our heart throughout everything we do. And I say that in jest. I love leading worship here. And, um, but I want to make the point that it is more about our life than it is just the times that we sing together. We worship God through our giving of tithes and offerings and the giving of our time. We worship the Lord through devoting time with him on a daily basis. We worship the Lord through our integrity of our workmanship and how we deal with our employees or our employer. We worship God with every aspect of our lives. We worship God in our devotion to our husbands and our wives. And we worship God with everything that we do. David says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be on my lips. Paul says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So Paul is saying, Take your body, take all the tasks that you have to do, your work, play, your rest, and offer it as an act of worship. Worship isn't simply one area of your life, it is your life. And third, worship is a matter of the heart. Colossians 3.23 says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Do it heartily or with all of your heart. God is always looking at the heart above all else. We may go through the motions of singing or praying or tithing or putting on our best outward appearance, but God looks at the heart and judges if our worship is sincere or not. And he is the one, the only one that can judge that. We see this clearly with the account of Cain and Abel. Adam and Eve's children Cain was a farmer, Abel a shepherd. Cain brought some apples and onions, and Abel brought the best animal he could and sacrificed it. Was there anything wrong with Cain's sacrifice or what he brought? No, it was what he had to offer. It was how he offered them. It was the posture of his heart. The problem was with Cain, not the offering. He did it without heart, insincerely, vainly, Selfishly, he was just checking it off his list of things to be done. Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Speaking of doing things heartily, I have a relative that can't carry a tune to save his life. But when it comes to singing in church, um, they do it with everything that is in them. <laughs> you might say, well, that must be distracting if, if he can't really sing. I want to tell you this, that I would rather be in a room full of people that are tone deaf, but they're giving Jesus everything that they have, than in a room of people with perfect pitch that are just going through the motions. And this is song boy talking. <laughs> Fourth, worship is participatory. Last week, Pastor Joe led us through the fourth commandment to keep the Sabbath day holy. We saw how God rested as an example to us to rest or break from our work and set aside a day to focus on him. So on the seventh day, God rested in his creation, worshiped and adored him. In our worship and adoration of him, God finds rest. God rests in our worship and we find rest in who God is. In music, we see an element called a musical rest. Points in time that the instrument is meant to be silent while another instrument plays. 
or at times all are silent. As a musician, we're taught that these rests are just as important as the notes. Imagine a, a timpani player not taking the rests that are, that are written and playing loudly over a very subdued flute solo or a trumpet player ignoring the rests and coming in on his solo in a new key before everybody else gets there. That sounds like cacophony, doesn't it? Well, there are times in music when a musician may have 50 measures of rests. Well, does he take a nap during that time? <laughs> no, I don't think so. He stays focused on the music, counting each measure, watching the conductor, remaining steady for when his time to come arrives, it is like this for us in our life as we move through our week, keeping an eye on the conductor, ready to sing his praises on measure seven. As we learned last week, God has demonstrated our need for rest. We need rest, but that rest is also our cue to praise him, to give him praise. That is our chance to sing. Now, imagine the ultimate Singer, songwriter, composer creates a symphony in six days and leaves a rest on the seventh day. A rest for all of his children and all of his creation to fill with one united note of praise. What a beautiful image of the creator inviting the creation to collaborate together. God wrote in a rest so that he could enjoy our one note of praise. He delights when we praise him. It says he is enthroned in our praises. He inhabits our praise. He loves to dwell in our praises. If you're a parent or if you have nieces or children that are near to you, you know the pride that you have when you see them play on stage in an orchestra or do a solo in a choir. God sees you and he feels the same way. An interesting little side note. Did you know that God has created our anatomy with a specific nerve in our vocal cords? The sole purpose of that nerve is to allow us to sing. If you cut that nerve, you'd be able to talk, but you wouldn't be able to sing. So let's journey now to the first stop on our way to worship the place of preparing our hearts. It's crucial that we take time to prepare our hearts to worship. Remember, God is looking at the sincerity of our heart, not just the fact that we have come out on Sunday in our best, cleaned up the outward man and checked off your list of things to do this week. Let me tell you, there is not much any worship leader can do to assist in meaningful, sincere corporate worship of Christ, no matter how talented they are, if those he is leading have not prepared their hearts first. There's not much I can do to help lead you before the throne of God if your heart and you have not taken that time to prepare it before him, before we even get together. So how do we apply this? Habakkuk 3.23 says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. In the Psalms, we often read the word selah, another musical term that we don't know the exact meaning of, but most scholars believe that is a break in the music, a moment of quiet reflection. It's a time to say, search me, and know my heart, O oh God. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me among the path of everlasting life. For some of you, this may be the first time that you have sat in silence this whole week. So let's take a selah right now. Focus on the one that is full of worth and prepare our hearts for worship.
In Exodus 19, before God delivered the Ten Commandments, he called the people to prepare to come into his presence or near his presence. But not actually onto the mountain where he would speak to Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. God wanted the people of Israel before they came near to him to get ready, to come near to him, to prepare themselves for an encounter with him. Was it the literal, the literal washing of the clothes that was important? Yes, because to God it was worth taking the time to do this. But I believe it is also symbolic of God washing their hearts and his people taking the time to ask for his forgiveness. Our hearts get dirty out there. And so God wants us to ask him to wash them in order to be, as David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I'd like to lead us in a prayer of confession, reading Psalms 51. If you'd read along with me in your heart. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justice when you judge Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your way so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it to you. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come long 
longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have Search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for It's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. And so, with your sin brought to full exposure and the depravity of your heart laid before all, you see your hopeless condition. In your desperate, desperate need of a savior, with head bowed low, you slowly walk to the next stop on your journey of worship. Off in the distance, you see a hill. And as you move closer, you see two logs in the shape of a cross. With each step, you see the remnants of sin strewn all around, thrown off by others that have gone before. Chains of addiction, the heavy load of guilt, a box filled with shame, a bag labeled not good enough. With each step closer to the cross, you feel the weight of your own sin dragging you further down until you are reduced to a crawl. And as you drag yourself closer, you feel a new bag strapped to your back. You step and then you open it and you find a book titled, all of your past sins with the subtitle too far gone to be forgiven devastated you start to turn back believing the lie but feel a hand on your shoulder it's a strong rough and weathered hand yet with a gentle touch he takes the bag and the book and he hangs it on the cross what is this place you ask this is Calvary, he responds. The road you just traveled, I too walked. I carried this cross while they beat me and spit on me, mocked me. As he shows you the scars, he says, I willingly allowed them to nail me to it. And I remained there until my last breath. I did it for you. Why would you do that? You say in disbelief, because I love you and I want to set you free. One by one, he takes the chains off and hangs them on the cross and you start to feel lighter. See, I have conquered death and nothing can separate you now from my love, he says. He takes off the last chain and in return, hands you a crown with the word forgiven on it. Oh, that is beautiful, you say, but I can't pay for it. All I have is this sack of ashes. It is my gift to you, he says. And in place of the sack of ashes, he hands you a picture of yourself. You turn it over to find the words, this is my child. I love her. She is perfect in my sight. 
If lost, please return to me, God. In all, all you manage to say is, but he puts a finger over your lips and says, all I want in return is your heart and gently reaches into your chest to replace your shriveled, decaying, barely beating heart with one made of the purest gold with the words, property of the king written in his blood. Property of the king. You see, I am no longer on that cross, he says, and it stands as an emblem of the suffering and shame that I bore in your place. You can't fully worship me without making a stop here. Remember this place and visit it often. Oh, I will, you reply. I will cherish this old rugged cross always. I will cling to it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Oh, my bride. 
after sitting at the cross for some time, you get up and start to walk joyfully on. But you quickly come to the edge of a deep pit. The pit smells awful and the heat from it is too intense. You back off and look for a way around it, but there is none. You must cross it. But how? You will surely die if you try. And then you remember. You run back to the cross, bear it on your back and drag it all the way to the pit. Laying it down across the pit, it forms a bridge which you safely cross to the other side. With the cross still visible in the distance, you continue your journey to worship and arrive at a magnificent throne. Thrones are where kings sit. There is no higher place than the kingdom of heaven. And there is no higher place within the kingdom of heaven than the king's throne. You start to tremble in fear just to be in the king's presence. You recall the words of the psalmist, Who am I that you are mindful of me? The light from the throne is so intense, so bright, yet you fall down on your face. All around you, you hear the living creatures repeating, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You let out a cry, Woe is me, for I'm undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I will dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, the father looks to his right and asks his son, do you know this one? Still trembling and fearing to look up, you feel a familiar hand on your shoulder and recognize the voice. This is my child whom I love as he takes the picture from my pocket and shows it to the father. His heart belongs to me, the king of glory proclaims. Come, come. Step up to the throne of grace boldly where you will obtain mercy and find grace to help you in the time of need. See, we're commanded by God not to come into his presence, to come near to him. Not only that, we can come boldly into his presence. As Hebrew 4, 6 makes clear, but there is a difference between coming boldly into the presence of God and coming arrogantly. When we come boldly into his presence and we draw near to him, we must always remember that we are to regard him as holy. When we approach his throne in worship, we do so reverently. Again, there are many things that we can do physically in worship to show our reverence. We can literally be on our knees. We can respect the sanctuary as a place that is set aside for the worship of the king, but I believe that the king is once again more concerned with the bowing of our hearts above all. my Savior. 
You are nearing the end of your journey when all of a sudden all of heaven erupts with a deafening sound like the roar of a million waterfalls like the sound of a million thunderclaps every creature in heaven and earth begins to shout the praises of the king there are no bystanders everyone and everything joins in all the saints and all the angels join together in musical praise no one says i can't carry a tune or my voice isn't good enough. Some express their praise in a joyful dance before the king. Others raise their hands and surrender, while others just stand in awe and fall to their knees. The praise begins to build. It's exuberant, electrifying. All of creation in grateful chorus praise with one united voice, praise the king, he is risen. The king is alive. Long live the king. How great is our God. Sing with me. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. 
To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Is he worthy? Yes, he is worthy. Your heart can't take it anymore. You must join in. The journey has led you to this point. Your body responds to the overwhelming gratefulness and joy inside. This is not some emotional roller coaster ride. This is what happens when you fully grasp what Jesus has done for you. The King of Heaven has called you His own. Rejoice! You hear the voices of many angels and living creatures and elders encircling the throne, and their number was uncountable. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. You hear every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. All of your earthly cares seem so dim, barely visible in this light. Your heart is full no, it's bursting. You want to remain here forever. This feels like home. The king approaches and looks you in the eye. Take this journey often. I love to dwell in your praises. I delight in them. Let me give you a clean heart. Come, sit with me at the cross. Come boldly around my throne. But remember, I am holy Fill your days praising me and I will fill your heart with joy. I love you, my child. Stay as long as you want. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
Joy still comes in the morning. Hope still walks with the hurting. If you're still alive and breathing, praise the Lord. Don't stop dancing and dreaming. There's still good news worth repeating. So lift your head. Hope still walks with the herd.